Welcome back to another episode of Harmonious at Lunch, the show that fuels your business success. I'm Brandon Gano, your host and guide through the world of harmonious business growth. Today, we're unlocking powerful strategies with industry experts to help your business thrive. If you're a business owner, entrepreneur, or executive, you are in the right place. Join me and our incredible guests today on the journey to clarity, growth, and success. It is time to revolutionize your approach to business. Let's dive in with another episode of Harmonious at Lunch. Welcome back in. We got some more bite-sized business advice. And today I recommend you go to a very specific restaurant to listen to this episode, possibly a Shuck and Shack oyster bar. More on that in just a minute. But we have an amazing guest today. We got Jonathan Weathington with us, uh, founder, owner of that very restaurant chain that I just mentioned is a franchise. I'm excited for this conversation, but before we go any further, Jonathan, welcome to the show and I appreciate you being here. Yeah, thanks for having me, Brandon. Appreciate that. So I actually, I reached out to you to be a guest on this show on LinkedIn because I've I followed your journey a little bit and uh, selfishly, I actually started a franchise a number of years ago, decided to kill it because after I spent all that money, which you know what that process looks like, I was like, eh, my heart's really not in this in this industry anymore. So I want to see how you went from an idea to starting a business to then eight ish years later, making that a franchise. And what's the journey been over the last 20 uh, ish years for you? So I'm, I'm really curious to dive in. I want to know though, first, like what was the idea behind Shuck and Shack? Where did this even come from? Sure. So I'm actually not a founder, which puts me in a really unique position. I, I knew the founders and I was around when Shuck and Shack was founded. And so the, the, the impetus and, and kind of the, the start of the story comes from there's no oyster bar in the tiny beach town of Carolina Beach, North Carolina in 2007. That's where it started. And so for, for any of you that have traveled the Carolina coast, you know that it's filled like many other coastal you know, regions filled with these small beach towns that are pretty sleepy in the off season. But really, you kind of count on that that essentially the, the kickoff is generally St. Patty's Day through Labor Day. That's that's the brunt of your season. But where do the locals go the rest of the year? And so the two founders, Matt Pickenen and Sean Cook, recognized the need and said, you know, why the hell is there not an oyster bar here? We're, we're next to some of the best oysters in the United States here, just, you know, essentially 40 minutes south of Stump Sound. And I think it'd be cool if we created a spot where we could have oysters, but more importantly, beer and a bar. And our friends would come and it would be awesome. They were in their 20s. What what 20 something doesn't want to have their own bar? And so that, the, <laughs> the foundation seems very simple, but that is the literal story. Um, I knew the guys. I was actually working for Sean at one of his businesses a couple of doors down and really saw it come out of the ground. So I'm in a very fortunate position as CEO now, some you know, 15, six, 17 years later that I actually got to see the founding of the store. Um, I, re I remember when it opened. I remember what that first summer open looked like and it, it just took off. And um, so that's kind of the the founder's story. I mean, I know them so well, I've, I've heard them talk about it and I happen to be at bird's eye view to it. So that, that's really how it all started. And then as it grew, it, it just took off like crazy, man. Believe it or not, neither of them had restaurant experience at all. And, but what they did know was how to make people happy, I think, which is a, a critical component of any growing business is that let's not forget we can put all the systems we want in place. We can do, you know, all the things on paper that we want. We can have the most beautiful pro forma and profitability and net on net cash returns and all of these things. But if you're not making the person happy that walks through the front door, then really none of that matters. It's all garbage. So garbage in, garbage out. But if you're attracting the right people into your business, you're hiring the right employees and you're doing all of those things, all of a sudden you start to see your top line grow, which leads to bottom line revenue. And all of a sudden it kind of falls in your lap and you're thinking, holy smokes, man, we've got an opportunity to second location. And that's exactly what they did. So 2012, I was actually in between jobs at the time and I helped them build the second location in downtown Wilmington, North Carolina, which is about 25 minutes from the original. And it took off the same way again keep it really, really simple in our approach to customer service and hospitality. At this point, we had secondary market proof and actually started looking for a third location in 13 and then considered the franchising route. You know, whenever you have kind of this niche concept, you're constantly approached that you should franchise this. I would love to open one of these in Charlotte or Raleigh or, or wherever else. And so, you know, I guess their thinking at the time was why the hell not? And they called me and 
early 14 and I came down for the weekend to hang out and they said, you know, we don't know where you fit, but we think you fit. Do you want to help us do this? And so I joined the team in July of 14 and consolidated a lot of the operational pieces and realized it was repeatable and profitable and something that we could do at a, at a broader scale. And we officially kicked off in mid 14, but really didn't get, you know, kind of the fire hot until, until 2015. That's interesting. I, and I love when things happen by accident, not that there wasn't intentionality behind how you guys have grown, but the, I, I just want to own my own bar kind of thing and, and turn yeah. it into a restaurant. Like that's, those are always the best stories because it, it's not like you went into it, not you, but the founders didn't go into it being like, I want to be millionaires one day. Uh, it, it's such yeah, an no authentic homegrown story. I love that. Yeah, no way. They, I mean, if you ask them even today, if they thought we would have, you know, double digit locations in six states and growing and, you know, a wild, rapid fan, fan base of millions of people, you know, they say, no, we just kind of wanted to stay open. That's our that's our goal. Anyone that opens a restaurant and bar the first year to 18 months is hell. It's awful. Um, you're trying to get your costs under control. You know, you, you, you constantly ask the question, where are these people coming from and why do they keep showing up? And <laughs> And all of a sudden that number grows and you kind of get a baseline under and you're like, OK, like I must be doing something right. I don't want to change anything. I want it to be exactly like this forever. And then it becomes something where I could think I could do this again. So, no, there was no intention whatsoever. This ever being a franchise or a franchisable concept. It was I'd like to stay open, maybe make enough money to pay my bills and put a little bit away. Um, you know, I've spent quite a bit of money opening the restaurant and let's just see where it goes. Yeah, it's awesome. Too, too many entrepreneurs stay there. I'm glad you guys made it past that. But I, I'm also curious because in, in food, in the food industry, you said it's hard. I think that's common knowledge that profit margins are typically low. The Where I see people focus though, is you save money on the labor. You just kind of hire whoever walks in the door. It seems like you guys took the opposite approach and you focused on good people uh, before anything else. And that's how you've grown. So talk to me about, you know, whether it's your recruiting process or just your core values and your alignment to the vision with the people you hire, what was it that really made you hire really good staff that then put out a good product for the customers? I think that we understand that a lot of people spend more time at work than they do at home. And that they don't actually spend more time at work. They spend more time thinking about work and their job. You know, they have bills to pay, they have food to put on the table. And it's it's very rare. I try to never use the term family when I'm talking about employees in a company. I, I think that's a disgrace. Um, these are these are partners. We should be working towards the same goal. And so we go in with that approach. These are these are our partners. Yes, there are employees, and and yes, we work together on a day to day basis. But really, what we're after is a partnership that's mutually beneficial for everyone. You do well at your job, and and you do the right things, and you serve your customers well, and that benefits you because you take home more money, you get more tips, you get more hours in the kitchen, whatever it may be. But it also benefits me because uh, the one thing that we have in common is we want people walking through the door. And so what we're primarily concerned with is hiring personalities. We want people that can talk to other people, that can make decisions, that don't necessarily think, oh, what would Matt think? Or what would Sean think? Or what would Jonathan think when I'm doing this? That think, you know what, I know this is the right thing to do right now. And so that's what I'm going to do. And so we're far more focused on hiring for personality than we are for hiring for someone that can have this kind of robotic bullet pointed approach to everything that they're doing. That's a great perspective too. And when you do that, you get a better quality person who's aligned with the mission of the company, as you mentioned, and the core values, because those are very, very important in making day-to-day -day decisions on the fly. How do you keep them engaged though? Like what, what is this? Do you know the standard rate of turnover in the food industry as a whole? And I, I would assume you guys beat that. It's over 100%. Uh, so typically and annually, it, most of the data is, you know, COVID changed a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, we, you saw incredible employee turnovers in COVID. And for instance, we, we've kind of bucked that trend. Our, our, a lot of our employees are long term going from 21 to 22, which was the absolute worst time for hiring ever that I've ever experienced we actually decreased our turnover by almost 40% in our company units. And that's because we talked to people. Um, let me say that again. We talked to our employees. That's important. Yes, of course, there's a financial component there. We gave almost everyone raises. You know, we had to take a long and hard look at the pro forma and what we were doing on the financial end and on the PL and all of those things. And that's important. 
But it was so much more than that. It's so much more than that. We had an open door policy. We've always had an open door policy, but we made that um, exceptionally clear over COVID. And we just said, hey, wh what do you need? Like people are going through loss within their own families or friendship bases and, you know, all of the restrictions. And, you know, that, that causes mental health anguish. You know, there's there's a lot of ancillary things and qualitative things beyond what am I going to make this year? What am I going to make hourly? And so we found a ton of success in just talking to our employees. Hey, you got this going on. You need next Friday off. You got it. I'll cover you. Not a problem. We'll find someone to cover you. That's not an issue. We did a lot of things like we went to a four day work week for some of our restaurant employees, which no one does. We gave them the option to do that, which means we were able to hire. Of course, they were the understanding of you may net lose some hours, but if you gain some quality of life, that may be a better option for you. And so we talked to our employees. It sounds simple, but I attribute our success in you know reduction of that turnover by almost 40 percent in our company units because we held conversations with our employees. We didn't ask them to fill out anonymous surveys. I would, I would go to someone, literally myself or Matt or Sean or our management staff will go to someone and say, what's going on in your life right now? Tell me what's going on in your life. Listen, your, your life is bigger than Chuck and Shack. You know, I don't expect you to give a shit about Chuck and Shack when you're not here. So let's talk about this. What's going on? It's crazy that you can actually talk to your employees. Is that 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 concept is lost, I think, these days. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's unreal. It, it is. I mean, I think a lot of problems um, and this is, you know, this, I guess, kind of this, this larger conversation is um, a lot of problems can be solved by just simple, direct communication, interpersonal communication and asking the right questions and, and being reassuring in those things and saying, no, look, if you've got a doctor's appointment or, you know, your, ch your, your child has to go somewhere or school field trip or you've got this going on or you need an extra day off this week or like we will work to get you covered. Like we know the statistics. OK, for us internally, for us to hire and train someone, it costs about twenty three hundred dollars. I would rather lose that person for one shift than pay twenty three hundred dollars to lose them as an employee. The math is very simple. Twenty three hundred dollars is a lot more than I would pay that person for one shift. And so it was very simple. You talk to your employees and you work it out. Or worse, what if they you lose them on one shift because you don't let them go and they check out, but they don't leave as an employee for four months? What's the damage right. they do to your brand and your customers over that time period because they're checked out? Nailed it. Because you're, you're saying, no, what I have going on right here in these next eight hours precludes anything that you might have going on personally. That is utter bullshit. Yeah. Um, because, the, you know, we we do very simple things, which is we serve exceptional food, high quality spirits, and we treat people exceptionally well. That's what we're doing. If I lose an employee, let's say a front of the house member, bartender, server, whatever it may be for eight hours, but that gives them the quality of life or the errand they need to run or take care of their child or go to the doctor or do whatever it is, then I know that they're going to look back at me and say, man, I really appreciate that. And they're going to work harder. It's actually going to have the opposite effect. It's going to increase their employee wellness. They're going to become internal net promoters of your system. And so you're then going to attract even better people within your system because the word is going to get around that you're a good person to work for. Yeah. I, this is why I reached out to you. I knew this was going to be a good conversation. So many people believe the opposite. I, I've made a number of posts about this on social media recently. And, and the comment section blows up because I've every company I've run, I've always put that mindset first that I'm here to support you, you and your life as the employee, because if I don't, you're going to kill my business with, without me having to do anything to do that. So people just, they get fired up over this and they think that the employees are there to serve the leader and the owner and the CEO. It's just so backwards. But I think the the outcome is very clear, especially for you, because you said something before we started recording, which is, I, I think, the very clear result of this behavior and this belief for your company that the customer gets a much better experience and customer service is really the most important thing when growing your brand, especially in food service. So how, do, I mean, how does this show up? Do you even have to train on customer service or does it just come out because you support your, your staff? I think the best training and equipping that you can do for your staff when it comes to customer service is give them the leeway and give them the rope to make the decisions for themselves. 
allow your staff to make their own mistakes. They will learn from those mistakes and it presents you with a coachable opportunity. That's the way it works for our brand. I cannot say that for every brand. I know many brands are different. Many brands will say, well, no, we have it so figured out. We've got 10,000 locations. We need this, this uh, employee pushing this button at exactly this moment. And then the next moment they're pushing this button. That is not the way it works in full service restaurants, in my opinion. When you have full service and you have a bar, which creates a natural atmosphere in and of itself, you have to train employees through coaching. And that coaching comes with the opportunity, number one, and I believe wholeheartedly in this and nothing will ever change my mind, allow people to be themselves. I have a real problem with people who you may go through the interview process and say, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Give me an example of a time where you took a bad situation and turned it into a good situation. And then their first day of work, or let's say they get through the training period after their first week, and then you negate all of that because you don't allow them to use their strengths. You don't you don't help them and coach them on their weaknesses. And then you don't give them an opportunity to turn a bad thing into a good situation. It is absolutely mind blowingly bizarre to me that we interview that way. And then we turn people into button pushers and robots. It makes absolutely no sense. And so I think one of my axiomatic core values is that we should allow people to be themselves. And I think when you do that, it allows people far more comfort in the workplace, not just for their own benefit, but it also rubs off on the customer. You've been in places, restaurants, retail stores, it doesn't matter, where people do not like being there, where, where the employees do not want to be there. I was in, I mean, I travel quite a bit for work, obviously, but I was in uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was out of town, I was at a bar, at a restaurant, and I sat at the bars by myself, and the bartender did not want to be there, did not want to be there. I mean, every interaction was curt, was succinct, was quick. And what would have been two hours for me because basketball was on turned into a 25, 30 minute visit. I ended up not even getting an alcoholic beverage. I had water and appetizer and I left and I went to somewhere else. But you went somewhere else. I went somewhere else. That's mm -hmm. right. And that opportunity cost was lost because that poor interaction with that person, they did not want to be there. And so whenever that happens, it kills your future business. And that's just that's one thing you can't do. I'm not interested in single use visits. I'm interested in the lifetime of the customer and that they're going to make a conscious decision to go back there because not only they feel comfortable there, but the people that work there like being there. Yeah, this is a masterclass in, in growing a brand, because whether you want to be a franchise, you want to have multiple locations or you just want to grow your your own business to whatever size. These are the principles that that have got to be in place. Um, and you guys have nailed them, which is absolutely fantastic. It's very, very rare to see that. And I love seeing that you nailed it. And not only did you nail it, but as a result, your brand is growing and thriving. So I'm curious, you have double digit locations. It's growing. It's successful. You made it through COVID. You have a soul, which is even better as a, as a company, <laughs> as a restaurant brand. <laughs> um, where are you going? Where are you? Where do you want to take this brand over the next three to five years? We want to open healthy restaurants. That's our primary purpose. And I think a, a lot of people, especially in the franchising game, if, you, if you're watching this or listening or whatever, you constantly get caught in this trap. And that trap is how many locations do you have planned? And then the second question is so very rarely asked, which is how many are you planning to open? Um, because it's very, very easy on the franchising end to say, We've sold 150 territories in 17 states. And yeah, who cares if we only open 35 of them? We want to every location that we award to our franchise strategic partners, we want to open it. And that's I'm, I'm so very conscious and so very serious about that. It's important that we um, give our franchisees who are our customers the best service possible put them in a position to succeed when they open their restaurants. And so we don't necessarily assign numbers. Yes, we'll continue to open locations in primarily in the Southeast US, but we wanna open healthy restaurants with good people. That, that's where we see ourselves. That's fantastic, I love that. I'm curious too though, because a healthy restaurant comes from, you, you have a healthy brand, but then there's a, there's a franchisee that's gonna be responsible for growing this company, managing that individual location. How do you make sure that you're not just getting people who want to invest in, in a brand and make a quick buck, but they're actually living up to your core values and into your brand integrity. 
Sure. I think the first thing is you set expectations, meaning wanting to invest in your brand and make a quick buck. I think the restaurant business, I mean, for those that aren't in the business, the, the profit margins are exceptionally slim. They get better with better top line. Your controllables essentially say, stay the same. So it's a numbers game, right? We're looking for hockey stick growth. And so the first year to 18 months is exceptionally tough. And this is what I tell interested franchisees that come into, into interested potential franchisees that come into our office. I say, this is going to be the worst 18 months of your life. There's no question. This, and if you are willing to put up with that 18 months, which is going to be the worst 18 months of your life, yeah, there will be fun times. Of course, you're going to have a blast. You get to tell all of your friends and family you're opening a restaurant. Oh, by the way, it's got a bar and we have great seafood. You get to do all that. But when it comes down to it, the restaurant is open 363 days a year for eh, roughly 12 hours a day. So do the math on that. And that's a lot more than a 40 hour work week. So if you're willing to invest that time, effort, energy, and money into opening the restaurant, then I think you're going to be a great fit. And then the second part of your question was, you know, how do you find those right people, essentially, which is you ask hard questions. You know, so very rarely people come into kind of our um, approval day or a, um, observation day process and we sit down with them at our at our table. And I think I think they're probably expecting us to ask questions about what does your business plan look like or things like that? What we're asking is, this is a question that I literally ask in every executive interview is, you just had a hell of a week. It's Friday, five o'clock, you're at your normal nine to five. You go out into the parking lot, you get in your car, you put it in reverse, you shift it into drive, where are you going? And if the answer is, I'm going home because I wanna be away from people, you're probably not gonna be a good franchisee because that's the time to turn it on because you're going to work all week, but your week in our business doesn't start until Friday night. And so you've got to be prepared to be on go all the time. You're essentially working a nine to five. You're getting your orders in. you're making sure your staff, yes, you're open for business, of course, but it's a little bit slower roll throughout the week. Your week starts Friday at five. And so you have got to be ready to go. And that's a really, really important tenant of our business. You always have to be on go especially when it comes to the weekend so that you can serve your customers well and give them a consistent experience. Yeah. And you have to lead people to do the same thing, which is an even harder task. So I, I love what you guys are doing. I, I'm a huge fan. This is, this is amazing. You have a location near me. I'm going to have to go check it out. It's about 25 minutes South. So uh, I'm excited to go see. And, and how about this? If I get there before this episode airs, I'll put my experience in the description. So uh, you Please watching do. or listening, wherever you are, you can go check that out and uh, and see if see if Jonathan lives up to his word, which I have absolutely no doubt that the restaurant experience. If I don't, you can email me directly. Anyone <laughs> listening, please do. That's awesome. Um, no, but I, I really appreciate you coming here. This is a fantastic conversation. If you want to find a location near you, wherever you are, I put the website on the screen. It'll be in the show notes as well, the shuckandshack.com. There's a number of locations, like he said, across the Southeast. I can't wait to go. Jonathan, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me, Brennan. Appreciate it. For you watching, listening, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss this daily madness that is Harmonious at Lunch. We want to just disrupt the way you think about business, help you grow your business, and make sure you are on the right path to success, just like Jonathan and the Shuck and Shack are. We'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for watching.